Hello, I'm Russell Michaels. Thank you for joining me and welcome to Cine Politics, where we discuss the social and, of course, the political issues which have inspired all kinds of films and documentaries from all around the world. And on today's programme, we're discussing the extraordinary documentary The Truth That Wasn't There, directed by Guy Gunaratne. Sri Lanka's 30-year civil war came to an end in May 2009, climaxing in a barrage of bullets and bloodshed. The government banned journalists from accessing the front lines during the final stages of its war with the Tamil Tigers, or LTTE, and propaganda and misinformation filled the void. But incredibly, three student journalists from London succeeded in getting access to restricted areas in northern Sri Lanka, which they hoped would reveal what had happened to the people who lived there. They arrived barely a month after the last bullet was fired. The army escorted them, controlling what they saw as they travelled north from Colombo to Chalai, the site of one of the bloodiest battles. But if the truth was the first casualty, what could three students reveal about a crisis that the Red Cross called an unimaginable humanitarian catastrophe? student journalist at a time. So when Sri Lanka became the biggest news story in the world, for me it was perfect timing. It was really intense at the time because everyone knew that the war was coming to an end. You don't know who to believe because both sides launched a huge propaganda campaign. You did feel it within your community, between the Tamils and the Sinhalese, between your friends and your family. This was not a story that we saw played out in the international media because of the lack of information from the ground about what was happening. And that is what media freedom is, that is what democracy is. This is the second attack on media institutions and media personnel who have dared to be independent, who have dared to have dissent. And clearly it's part of a plan. Barely a month, and there's scarcely anything left here. Because, I mean, I think you fight a war to win a better future. People don't compromise because they want to, they compromise because they have to. Doctors have been threatened, harassed, abducted, assaulted. There's too big a price to pay. It's on us. We've got to do what real journalists could. I guess we are real journalists now. Ready? You come there with your microphone, your cameras, and your you know, reporting skills, and all the journalistic skills you've ever learned come there looking for the truth, but how do you find truth in a place like that? So what did the three students reveal? And of the estimated 40,000 dead, how many were innocent civilians? Well, here to discuss the truth that wasn't there are my guests, Dr. David Rampton from SOAS at the University of London, who specializes in the politics of nationalism in Sri Lanka, and we have veteran film critic Neil Norman. A very warm welcome to the programme to both of you. To start with you, Neil, um, the three student journalists, Guy Gunaratne, Philip Panchenko and Heidi Lindval, we should say their names, how do they change on their journey kind of inside themselves and also outside as they go from student to journalists? Well, it's, it's quite a dramatic journey, actually, because they start off <clears throat> with all the ideals of um, young campaigning journalists. They're going to go into this um, particularly particularly difficult arena. Um, they've got access, unprecedented access, yeah. um, because they're students, basically. And um, in the process of this, they, they grow up as people because they see the, uh, the difficulties that are facing them as human beings, but also they grow up as a journalist to, to an extent um, uh, rather disappointingly, I think that they yeah. become very, very, uh, very, very dispirited by their experiences. And they do feel a sense of responsibility that if they're there recording with their cameras and yes. their eyes, then nobody else is but them. So, David, I've got to ask you, um, rather than just why the government allowed them in, did the government feel that they could control what they were doing, that it would be a good image that they were going to portray of Sri Lanka just days and months after the, after the war ended? Um, I think we definitely um, should uh, think that that is the case um, because this occurred within a context where the government were very keen to restrict 
know, journalistic access, access of NGOs and humanitarian workers. So I, f I, I certainly feel that the government must have considered their request um, and felt that they could manage, uh, a stage manager essentially, um, the access. And we see at the beginning of the film there are protests, particularly in London from the Tamil community. Mm. Um, they're holding up placards saying 4,000 dead as a very low figure at that point. Mm. What did those people know? I've heard there were escapees from camps. What was informing the protesters that maybe journalists didn't know? Well, I think there's a kind of common sense idea that the diaspora have a disconnect from Sri Lanka, but what one should understand is that the war had been going on since 2006, um, and in that case, this produces refugees and asylum seekers, mm. um, and people were also um, escaping from the camps using funds from the diaspora. So there are linkages between the diaspora and the Tamil community within Sri Lanka, and um, those who had witnessed um, the events unfolding in Sri Lanka would have communicated that and brought those stories with them um, to the points of exile. So it was based on factual witness reports? Yes. Right, well, let's pause there and see a clip where the army shows the three filmmakers a detention camp for Tamil civilians. But is it too good to be true? Gold and money. Yeah. And they are doing jobs also. We are sending more than 1,000, between 1,000, 1,500 people to labor jobs for other various zones. Manic Farm was actually split into separate zones at the time, but the only zone news crews or UN dignitaries were taken to was this one, Zone Zero, the least populated and the oldest existing. The purpose of these camps were twofold. The first was as a camp for the displaced so they could be housed and secure. But the other was to screen these civilians for LTTE Carter. And that was what human rights groups around the world were calling the government out on. These people were essentially held without trial and were not allowed to leave, which meant getting their testimony on camera all the more important. I lost my mother and sister last uh, uh, March. Uh, 25 by shelling. Uh, I displaced uh, the, uh, to this camp last April and uh, live here. Yeah. I teach uh, this uh, school. Uh, I am suffering from this uh, uh, lost, uh, losing. Yeah. I feel your loss. Uh, I mean, are you, are you happy here when everything uh, is going on? Yeah. Happy. Yeah. Okay. Right. You want to take uh, Yeah, please, yeah. please. Yeah. So, Guy was kind of waving to me to come over, so I thought he had something. I think just out of the blue, he suddenly said... I'm feeling in a shoe. I'm feeling in a shoe. I am in a animal. Yeah. And all are in a... So I am in a animal. Yeah. And all are in a... And all of a sudden we were just... Did he just say what I think he just said? Feeling in the shoe, I am in a animal. As soon as he said it, he yeah. suddenly stopped. I looked around, it was Major Kamara. He pulled me by the arm and he led me away. Neil, <clears throat> Major Kamara um, appears in the beginning and the end there of that clip. Do you believe him when he said in the film that the, the Tamils there are happier and better off than they were outside in normal <laughs> civilian life. Well, what we have to understand, I think, about this film is that it's not really a documentary. It's a meta-documentary. Okay. Um, it's um, the way it's been constructed because they didn't really get the truth. Um, they have to then unpick what it is they did get. Yes. And um, uh, what they realise, of course, and especially in this particular camp, um, that is that they're being shown a kind of Disneyland. Um, um, it's, they're, being, they're being given propaganda. And I think that that is rather important in terms of... It's actually, it's the most important thing that they, they, they find out because there's no way that they're going to be able to penetrate further um, <clears throat> and get people to admit um, what's really going on. You can tell from the faces of, the, of some of the camp 
people, although he's blocked out, that they're absolutely terrified. And there are other zones where people were not yes. treated as well. That We see in the zones they filmed, we see schools and people apparently living somewhat normally. Um, David, what, other than your take on that scene, what also is missing from the film in terms of um, videos that have come out since and during that time? Executions, bombings of civilian hospitals, how important is that information and that, that video footage? Yeah, I think, I mean, the documentary kind of somewhat lives in the shadow of um, some of that uh, evidence that has come out, video evidence. Well, what we have mm. seen is that uh, we, ha we have pictures um, taken by soldiers as kind of trophies um, mm -hmm. in the aftermath of war um, of executions of um, Tamil LTTE uh, cadres. We have pictures of um, and witnesses to artillery and aerial bombardment of um, hospitals and of areas of civilian um, displacement. And this seems well. to have come from the, the kind of phone cameras that soldiers had, is yes, that correct? that's correct, yeah. What, what does it mean in terms of war crimes? I mean, how, how evidential is that, do you think? Because that's the allegations that have been... Um, both sides, the Tamil Tigers and the government, yes. are being uh, mm. alleged. I think um, that video evidence is also key. I think there, there is also other evidence, but the video evidence has been key, and the Channel 4 doc documentary has been shown uh, in key places. It's been shown in Washington, it's been shown in Geneva, so it's been shown in some key political capitals, and certainly is shown alongside debates about the war crimes um, by those who firmly believe that war crimes have taken place. The Channel 4 documentary that was aired in Britain included quite a lot of that footage yeah. and very disturbing it was too. Neil, uh, how does the army portrayed in this film though? There you see Colonel Kumara, General Major Kumara. Yes, uh, well obviously in control, I mean, um, they, and, but, but they, they're, they're portrayed in the, in, not in the best possible light but in the light that they are, they are strong and they have um, created a situation that is now uh, relatively peaceful. I mean what's interesting earlier on is of course that you get um, interviews with um, Signally, uh, civilians who 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 are just so grateful that the violence has stopped, and that they they're calling for the president to be called a saint, um, and that strikes home because there's what you realise is there is no middle ground in this conflict mm. and in this post conflict. There is no sense of a, a moderate middle ground. It is either you know it is really kill or be killed, and they did suffer you know nearly three decades and twenty six years. Mm of appalling uh, regular bombings by the Tamil Tigers. I've got to pause there and move okay. on to a clip, but it's fascinating and disturbing stuff. Well, let's see a clip where the filmmakers witness the devastation caused by the war and they report on the brutal suppression of Sri Lanka's media by the government. It was like a three hour drive and this is how it looked everywhere. It's only so long you can say, oh, look at that ruined house, oh, look at that ruined house. I mean, they're all ruined. There was nothing there. J.S. Tissanayagam was a Sri Lankan journalist working for English language newspaper, The Sunday Leader. In March 2008, he was arrested and indicted under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. A year later, he was sentenced to 20 years of rigorous imprisonment. And his story was just one in a string of cases where journalists were branded traitors. The government had made sure that the horrors of this war were not seen by ordinary civilians here or anyone abroad. But that meant now that the war was over, any talk about what had happened during those final months was seen as irrelevant. Anyone who's heard to question the government-led pro-war narrative came under threat. And since 2006, there had been a significant rise of the numbers of journalists who had been threatened, harassed, abducted, assaulted. And many have since left the country in exile. When Sunday leader editor Lasantha Wickramatunga was killed, it made international news. Lasantha was one of the most prominent journalists in Sri Lanka and had been critical of the war effort from the start. After his murder, the Sunday leader published a posthumous article where Lasantha predicted his own death and claimed that when he was eventually killed, it would be the government that would kill him.
David, uh, J.S. Tisnayagam, he's been imprisoned. Um, La Santa has been murdered. What the film doesn't tell me, I mm. felt, was what they wrote that caused those actions against them. Um, I think that um, journalism in Sri Lanka, um, in the current context, uh, has been pursuing what journalism is normally expected of journalism in any kind of democratic environment. So investigating corruption, uh, investigating rights abuses, investigating um, violence. Um, so the kinds of things that they've been investigating are not beyond what we would normally expect of um, a responsible journalism. But then the, the reaction to those two gentlemen at least was pretty extreme, mm. oh very extreme. Um, Neil, uh, what, uh, the, the Amnesty International lady in the film says, well, the, the people should be very wary of being asked to give up their rights of free speech or free media. Were the people asked? Did you get any impression that the people had any choice? No, I didn't actually, no. I mean, uh, it's, it, because there's so much that's hidden here uh, in this particular society now, but I mean that now, now, now obviously uh, facts are emerging or suggested are emerging that the crackdown is much harder than we could possibly have imagined. Mm. Um, and that, um, you know, there is no such thing as journalistic free speech or access or whatever. It's, it's, it's really worrying, you know. I don't think anybody's been asked, no. I think the Singhalese majority are just relieved and they will let, they, were, they are happy to give whatever up Whatever it takes. Yes. David, at the time the war was um, kind of climaxing, uh, the former <coughs> Defence Secretary Liam Fox was in Colombo. UK sold arms to the Sri Lankan government. How are those two connected and what connection did he have to the war and the government itself? Well, we know, I mean, Labour was in power in the final stages of the war. Um, so we know that the government didn't um, revoke weapons export licenses until mid-2009, which was after the war's end. So too late. In too late. Words. Too little, too late. Um, <coughs> but we also know that, that there are considerable allegations and reports about Liam Fox um, and you know, his assistant um, Verity being personally involved, uh, apparently, in negotiation in relation to the arms trade with Sri Lankan government officials. The LTTE had a headquarters in London. How significant is that, that they were branded a, you know, a terrorist organisation but also were based in London, apparently operating freely? Yeah, I think you know, action was not taken against the LTTE until the kind of final stages of the war. And I think you know, there was a tacit agreement between the LTTE and state you know, security forces within the UK um, that if the LTTE did not rock the boat um, and create violence within the space of UK territory, right. then the LTTE could continue um, their operations and activities. Kind of turning a blind eye at the time. OK, well, let's pause there and see our last clip where the filmmakers arrive in Malativu, where a bloody battle <coughs> ended the LTTE. But what happened to the thousands of civilians caught in the crossfire? One of the stories that hadn't been told took place at Varavakal Causeway, a small lagoon in Malativu. The army had forced the last remaining LTTE into a small strip of land. According to the government, the Tigers were holding thousands of civilians hostage as human shields against the army's bombardment. But the army successfully freed most of the civilians and crushed the LTTE at this very spot. And this pivotal moment was never witnessed by an independent journalist. holding this patch. They were holding the other patch. And uh, one particular night we launched a battalion here, had a major fight there, and then we used our small group, the snipers, to go and get this LTT. They are, they are, they are sentries. Uh, we neutralized them, rescued the civilians just one night. We got that night about 79,000 civilians. So it's a divisional uh, maneuver to the other side. It was very difficult. But you did it. Yeah, we did it. And we want to do it without civilian casualties also. That's a major challenge that we had an as an army, you know. We mm. could not use our major guns, heavy weapons. Civilians are so very close to us. Uh, did, they, did they come from here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah.
this was, this was it. This was where it happened. And I remember looking around and it was so beautiful. And he was describing dead bodies and fallen soldiers and just chaos. And all I saw was serenity and stillness and beauty. I want to ask you, David, uh, after I've asked Neil, but I want to know what you think of what we've just seen there. But first of all, Neil, uh, the title and the conclusion really is the truth wasn't there. Do you think that that, that kind of encourages the audience not to ask any more questions? There's a kind of shrug. No, no, I don't. I, I think if there is um, if there's a reaction to this um, to this film, then it is to actually ask questions. And think, well, actually, what did happen? You know, that these guys didn't get. Okay. I mean, you know, um, as you started with, you know, the first casualty of war is the truth. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, clearly, there's, clearly there's a lot hidden under the surface there. And David, mm. what, what do you make of the officer's words there that that spit of land, he, they rescued 79,000 people. Are there any other witnesses and different points of view that maybe counter that? Well, I think on the one hand, people did escape the spit. Um, when a breach was made, and that is completely understandable because mm -hmm. civilians wanted to escape, you know, an extremely oppressive environment. But it's an environment where they had been subject to aerial and artillery bombardment, and there's considerable evidence to suggest um, that those kind of atrocities took place and were targeted upon that s spit, which is densely packed with civilian displaced. Do you think what we heard there was a half truth or not? Not I think the truth. it may have been a half truth. I, I, I can't corroborate it entirely, but it is possible that his unit did not engage um, as fully as they could have. But he must have surely been um, with the knowledge of uh, the kinds of artillery and uh, uh, bombardment that had been targeted upon that area. There is currently a process going on called the Sri Lankan Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. It's interestingly not called a tr Truth Commission. Mm. Um, is, it, is it healing the country? Is it finding out truth? On the one hand, some observers were quite surprised when the LLRC report came out in as far as it did say things about the need for devolution and changes to governance. However, um, a number of different humanitarian and human rights advocacy organisations have condemned it because it has really not um, uh, acknowledged the human rights abuses and the issue of war crimes. Neil, there are two narratives the film is saying, one's the government's, the other's the civilians. Has the government's narrative won? Um, no, it's very difficult to say. I, yes, in, in a sense that it's, 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 given, it's given, delivered its propaganda, but no in the sense that I think that is, uh, this particular work has actually mm -hmm. exposed the fact that it is propaganda. Um, so okay. Very briefly, do you think that war could return if inequality keeps on the way it has been? Yes, I think without a politically negotiated solution, um, war will return. I think we're already seeing the return of low intensity conflict. That's all of time for, but that is a worrying note to end on. Thank you very much. Warm thank you to my guests, David Rampton and Neil Norman, and also thank you. And please do join us again at the same time next week. But in the meantime, we'd love to hear your views too, of course. So, as usual, please do email us at the address on the screen, cinepolitics at presstv.co.uk. And also, why not click on our Facebook fan page and join the debate there with your questions or any suggestions for future films that we could discuss here. But for now, goodbye.